Okay, we are live with another Radical Philosophy Hour. So happy to be here and be joined by a couple of excellent uh, scholars. Um, also, you know, just very excited to do another Radical Philosophy Hour. We will be um, continuing the Radical Philosophy Hour tradition next month in September. So keep an eye out. I think in September, unfortunately, as you may know, the first Monday of the month is a, a national holiday. So we'll be taking that day off, but look for us in mid-September on Monday. Um, I believe it's September 15th. So, uh, but we'll be in mid-September on Monday, coming back to you live with Radical Philosophy Hour. I certainly will be updating Facebook and uh, letting you know. So just keep an eye out for the specific date and we'll be here. Uh, when we come back, we're gonna be talking about uh, issues that are very important right now. Um, environmental philosophy, we'll have a couple of uh, really great, we, uh, we'll be joined by Mario Line Ulla from um, uh, University of San Francisco. She'll be talking about um, elemental loss, earth instability and quakes. We'll also be joined by Brian Trainer. So two excellent and interesting uh, philosophers who are working on questions of ecology and environment. And they'll be, you know, I think really contributing to our understanding of what's happening in the world around us. Um, I myself am from Eastern Kentucky. So right now, uh, these questions are very form very front and center in, in my mind. All right, so um, with all that said, we have a really exciting program today to turn to. And today we'll be hearing from two really exciting uh, philosophers. First, we have uh, Tiffany Montoya. Um, she is a visiting assistant professor of philosophy at Muhlenberg College in Pennsylvania. She received her PhD in philosophy from Purdue University, specializing in political theory, philosophy of race. Uh, she also has upcoming articles on mutual aid, necro being within capitalism, and the historically evolving meaning of Hispanidad. But her biggest project right now um, is elaborating upon her theory of organicism, an ontological foundation for normative political theory. She hopes that uh, with this foundation, we can effectively judge the morality of certain ways of arranging political and economic structures that would be based on a core set of ontological features of the human being. We're also joined by Patrick D. Anderson. Patrick is an assistant professor of philosophy at Central State University in Ohio. And he's also the editor in chief of the WikiLeaks biography and the author of Cyberpunk Ethics, A Radical Ethics for the Digital Age. His research in Africana philosophy and philosophy of race appears in the Journal of Black Studies, the CLR James Journal, and the Journal of French and Francophone Philosophy. Um, his work in social political philosophy has been published in Radical Philosophy Review and Distinction, the Journal of Social Theory. Uh, his research in applied ethics, cryptography, and communication technology appears in Ethics and Information Technology, Surveillance and Society, as well as the Journal of Medical Ethics and Ethical Space, the International Journal of Communication Ethics. So like I said, two really exciting scholars, and they're going to be talking today uh, with us about punk. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Tiffany, and she's going to talk to us a little bit more. Okay, thank you, Brandon. Um, and thank you to the RPA for giving us this platform to share some of the work that we're doing. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you all. Okay, are we good? Okay. Um, so yeah, so like Brandon said, today I'm gonna be talking to you all about um, punk uh, as, a, as a music genre and as a subculture um, and the political uh, weight of it, the political weight of the movement itself. Um, and the presentation that I'm gonna be giving to you all is actually uh, coming from a chapter that I have coming forthcoming um, in a book. Uh, I'm not sure what the title is going to be yet. I don't think that was decided yet. It's about punk pop culture and philosophy, specifically about punk rock and philosophy. Uh, Patrick Anderson is also in this collection of um, essays. So um, the book should be coming out soon. Um, but saying that, um, 
I'm bringing that up because the way that it's written is more for a general audience. And so although this is a philosophical platform, um, there will be philosophy in it, but it's a little bit more simplified, which I think will be good for those people who are in the audience who, um, who might not be philosophers. And for those in the audience who are philosophers, uh, bear with me with its um, simplicity, and then we can get more into um, some of the philosophy uh, in, the, in the Q and A period. Um, I have some slides here that I'm going to have you all look at. Uh, it's mostly just images and just things for you to look at while I'm talking. Um, but also there's going to be lots of lyrics. So it's going to be really, it's going to look really text heavy, but it's just because uh, through doing this research, I had to dig through decades of lyrics and it would take too long to play all the songs and read all the lyrics. So you all can kind of read through them while I'm talking to you. Um, okay. So let's get started. Okay, so punk rock primarily started as a musical subculture for and by young and disaffected working class youth. And it provided them a space to turn their grievances into music and feel less alone. It was a home for the outcast, the losers and the downtrodden of society. We can see just simple example, let's just consider the band names, the types of band names that you see throughout punk rock. You see the subhumans, the unseen, the exploited, um, lower class threats, all these sort of uh, these names that sort of signify what type of class of people we're talking about. But the music itself, both in content and in form, although it, for this presentation, for the sake of brevity, I'm only gonna be talking about the content of the music rather than the form. Um, but the music was a clear expression or an, of an artistic, or a clear expression or slash artistic representation of an emerging class consciousness. And the culture or the quote unquote scene was a learning site for this growing consciousness and an, and an example of a proletarian culture. And throughout the presentation, I'll refer to some of the philosophers like Karl Marx and Georg Lukács um, and Antonio Gramsci to help us understand why, why I came to this conclusion. I also demonstrate that there are three primary stages of consciousness on the way to full class consciousness. And we can see examples of this in the lyrics as you'll, as you'll see throughout the, the presentation. But it wasn't just that the lyrics shouted anti-establishment or anti-capitalist messages or that the music style energized a revolutionary fervor, but the scene itself attempted to create alternative realities through DIY culture, egalitarianism, and mutual aid. Uh, but ultimately, the revolutionary potential of punk as a subculture remains up for question and hinges on its ability to hold steadfast to these original values. So given the platform that I'm presenting on, the RPA, um, I don't think I need to summarize uh, Marxism 101 too, too much, but uh, just in case there's, you know, um, you know for the, the rest of the audience, um, I'll explain it really briefly. But the bottom line is that we can see some of the basic premises and motifs of Marxism throughout punk songs. So you can see, um, these ideas of like class consciousness, of alienation from one's work, of exploitation, of uh, becoming a commodity. Um, and so, so just as like a really brief little Marxism 101 for, for the non-philosophers in the audience, um, class consciousness is a process of gradual awareness of the mechanisms of a class-based society and one's role within it. Um, and then, Marxism generally is this just general idea of this the antagonism between two classes within capitalism, the proletariat and the bourgeoisie, or the working class and the capitalist class. Uh, the proletariat as that class of laborers who must work as a means of survival. In other words, they have no other choice. They either work or they starve and die, right? So it's, it's a necessity, but they can only work if their labor produces profit for the owner. They can and then they consider this, and the Marxists consider this exploitative because the relationship is not only forced through circumstance, like forced through uh, the circumstance that the, the worker is in, but also because the capitalist extracts a profit out of the wealth that the worker produces. And then that this process 
creates further residual effects such as alienation from one's work. Um, alienation being like that feeling that everyone's familiar with that uh, like when you have your, your menial job in high school or something or um, when working or working on an assembly line or any of these instances where the you have a feeling that the work that you do is meaningless and bears no relation to your true self. Um, and then alienation also arises because wage laborers are essentially a commodity for capitalists. So there's this process of commodification, right? So, um, so eventually the, the, the worker themselves is, the, is a, a part of the commodity. Um, and then so in this process, when we ourselves are commodified, we begin to view others as mere objects like ourselves. And in this way, we become alienated also from our peers and we begin to view them as competition because we view them as commodities also and we're just in competition with them. And this process of alien, alienating humans or objectifying subjects um, as passive and expendable and determined is what the philosopher Georg Lukash calls reification. So all of this, everything that I said in the previous slide, is perpetuated by maintaining a status quo ideology. And so this term superstructure is a term that the philosopher Antonio Gramsci used to describe the institutions and structures of society that create the ideology and culture, such as um, like art, music, the media, even like school curriculum or religion. Um, just these general, these, these larger institutions, just any institution throughout society, um, they're gonna play a role in creating these, these ideologies. And then the term hegemony, um, as Gramsci describes it, uh, is sort of that, that culture that holds the overarching power and domination. So the term, you put those two terms together, hegemonic superstructure would be the Marxist equivalent of like mainstream culture. And this mainstream culture or this hegemonic superstructure is essentially what the ideology that undergirds capitalism. But the proletariat themselves have the potential to dismantle this hegemonic superstructure by unifying and collectively fighting for their own class interests if and when they become aware or conscious of the what we call the relations of production. That is the relationship between who controls the wealth and who does the work to produce it. And Lukash theorizes about this process of becoming aware or this class consciousness um, that he's, he asks this question, he, he has this sort of pressing question that how could, how could the proletariat break free from the ruling ideology if the ruling ideology dominates everything? Or if we put it another way, how did punk arise out of a sea of mainstream culture? Or where do radical ideas come from if the mainstream is mainstream? So then we move on to the philosopher um, Lukash. If, if, um, if Gramsci was talking about superstructure and hegemony, uh, we can look to Lukash to figure out how to escape it, although Gramsci also has his ideas for how to escape it too that are useful here. But so Lukash thought that the advantage that the proletariat has over the bourgeoisie is uh, their ability to see society from the center as a coherent whole. And so from this perspective, um, they can sort, so in other words, from the perspective of the factory worker, from the perspective of living in ghettos or things like that. Um, but he says that it's not quite enough. So this perspective that like, oh, everything sucks and I just like live a really shitty life is not enough to bring about punk rebellion. This would simply be a sort of like misanthropic individualism. Um, which is then a symptom of reification. But rather the irony of rebellion is that it's only successful through community. 
So punk culture doesn't exist without the people or the groups that make it up. Likewise, the proletariat cannot emancipate itself without uniting. So for Lukash, this uniting or this community or this coming together is gonna to be really important. Uh, he says it's, in, it's strategically impossible to escape the hegemonic superstructure on one's own as an isolated individual. So punk rebellion essentially rose, arose through the unity of like-minded people coming together to combat the status quo. So just as the proletariat working side by side in a factory can begin to see and begin to share their grievances with one another, so too did punks recognize and share their societal grievances among their peers in the scene. This collective socioeconomic vantage point and its general cultural attitude has developed into one of the only music genres that has so thoroughly wrestled with peeling itself away from the mainstream hegemonic culture. And through this process, punk as a general culture and art form has developed an unmistakable uh, class consciousness. So we'll begin to look at this class consciousness. So I developed these or sort of divided up the, the lyrics that I had sorted through, divided them up into these three different stages. Um, you have, uh, we can see from these three main stages, uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought, uh, that all of these three stages of awareness are sort of en route to full class consciousness. So they range from, the first one being a general discontent with one's lot in life. The second one being an awareness that one's misfortunes have systemic causes. The third being full class consciousness as the realization of the social relations of production in tandem with the empowerment of the proletariat. So one sense of agency also evolves through these stages. So as you go through each stage, the individual's agency might also increase. Um, the first stage, going back to the first stage, is devoid of class consciousness, but expresses a general nihilistic discontent, which is, it's still effective in creating a sense of like not being alone in one's struggles, so you can sort of like uh, commune with your peers who are experiencing similar things. The second stage is a chrysalis, where one not only sees that their struggles are not unique, but also that the veils of reification begin to fall. So as we start to gradually reveal the inner mechanisms of capitalism in the second stage. And in the final stage, class consciousness allows one to see themselves as a catalyst of history and thus turning what Lukash calls a quote, a mere psychological state of consciousness into strategy and praxis. So, Let's start with the first stage. Let me unpack this a little bit more. So stage one, discontent and nihilism. The songs of nihilism and alienation are plentiful in punk. They portray degradation. Um, for example, like the song by uh, that I have here of like, from the adolescence or morning glory or the addicts, uh, or they represent despondent individualism, um, which we might see from the days and days as a good example, or they might portray like a general boredom, which we might see from the, um, like the Verugers song. Um, many songs in this stage of consciousness are about the particular class of people that Marx might call the lumpen proletariat, i.e. the lowest rung of the proletariat, like the unemployed, the vagabonds, the criminals, the junkies, the squatters. Um, these people, according to Marx, are necessary for capitalism because they serve as a reserve army of labor. Uh, in other words, like a surplus population of unemployed people to keep labor costs low. But while their financial and existential precarity is the result of these larger forces and relations of capitalist production, their degree of social awareness portrayed in these songs stops at the individual experience. This stage of consciousness 
also applies to songs depicting the, so it doesn't have to be um, lumpen proletariat because these this stage also works um, when we're depicting the songs of like comfortable middle-class um, people who have the privilege of experiencing boredom and consumerist alienation. Um, and, and also I guess it, as I'm going through all of these different lyrics, I should um, point out or reinforce my thesis that that this is a this is a, a general um, class consciousness coming from the music itself or from the lyric or as portrayed in the lyrics as if it was as an art form rather than portraying the class consciousness of the individual like right like musicians right or the the bands themselves so we're looking at a class consciousness um, as portrayed in the art form and as a general culture rather than making assumptions about the class consciousness of individual bands or individual musicians. Um, and then on stage two, uh, then we start to get more of a systemic awareness. So songs that lie in the second stage of consciousness evolve from a solipsistic nihilism to a systemic awareness of its causes. So the lyrics don't yet point to any solution. There's not yet a development of proletarian agency, but there is more recognition of general systemic exploitation with the complexity of their analysis lying on a spectrum. So um, some of them might be very, uh, very simple uh, critiques of the system, the quote unquote system, and others might be a little bit more complex, um, but they're all gonna sort of fall in this, in this range. And then many of the songs in this stage are critical of power and authority generally. And this topic of anti-authoritarianism and anti-establishment might actually make up the largest number of punk songs. But within this stage, there are also many songs that extend beyond a sort of like fuck the systems mentality into a more specific class antagonism, meaning that they recognize that the, they might identify um, specific entities. So they might recognize that the interests of the bosses or the businessmen or the elites don't align with the interests of the workers or the common people. Um, but even the songs that express a more explicit understanding of class relations would not yet be considered full class consciousness or revolutionary consciousness because as Lukash and Gramsci would add, they have yet to describe the moral or historical role of the subject or the worker. So this final stage, when we can say that punk is an expression of full class consciousness arises in the instances where the lyrics express not only an understanding of the source of alienation and exploitation, but also return agency back to the proletariat. So the song Class War by the Dills uh, was written in 1977, and then it was covered again by DOA in 1982, and then again recently by the adolescents. Um, this song keeps getting recycled over and over. It clearly states a recognition of class antagonisms between rich and poor. And just in general, one would discover a very long list. Um, if you searched for all the punk songs with Class War, somewhere in the title or lyrics or the general theme. The subject in these, like the person or the subject in these songs is no longer pushed, ar pushed around by the whims of capitalist society, but instead is empowered through identification with their class. And these songs might start with a complaint, um, but rather than resorting to a sort of solipsistic nihilism, they result in a call to action. So punk has actually taken many stylistic and lyrical themes from folk music, particularly protest music from the early 20th century America. Uh, so various punk bands have made covers of folk songs that have deliberately served as rallying anthems for working class movements. For example, the 1931 pro-labor song, Which Side Are You On? was written by Florence Reese and then adopted by other folk singers like Pete Seeger. Um, was covered by the Dropkick Murphys, for example. Joe Hill, the labor activist and member of the IWW, 
wrote um, There's Power in a Union in 1913, another popular and widely adopted labor song um, by like other folk singers like Billy Bragg. And that one was covered by the Street Dogs um, and also referenced by Rancid's A Power Inside. And concurrently, if they weren't covering an old folk song, many of the bands wrote songs about past labor struggles, such as Against All Authorities, Haymarket Square. Um, both the song Union Blood and Harry Bridges by Rancid are, are songs about the West Coast waterfront strike of 1934, which shut down all the ports along the West Coast and culminated in the San Francisco general strike. The songs reference the labor union organizer, Harry Bridges. It references the Red Scare that was going on at the time and how this and other um, uncompromising strikes, as they say, um, they mentioned the Toledo auto strike and the Minneapolis Teamster strike, both in 1934, um, paved the way for boosting the confidence of the workers and the upsurge of union organizing in the 1930s. And then, Anti-Flag's song titled 1915 is about Joe Hill, the labor activist mentioned above, um, who was executed in 1915. The song references his swift and questionable trial. It quotes his last will and ends with a portion of, um, of his song, Workers of the World Awaken, which on the slide you can see him holding there where he says, if we the workers take a notion, we can stop all speeding trains every skip upon the ocean, we can tie with mighty chains, every wheel in the creation, every... Hi? Someone knows this song better than I do. <laughs> My, every mine and every mill uh, floats and the print is really strange, huh? floats and fleets and armies of all nations will at our command stand still. Um, also, the punk band Refused named their second full-length album Songs to Fan the Flames of Discontent after one of the early editions of the IWW's Little Red Songbook. So all of this is just to say that folk music was sort of like the, uh, like the OG of music genres that mobilized people into action. And it served as a cultural vanguard by agitating and educating the common folk about the relations of production uh, and this concept of the of vanguard is this notion that the leaders or the organizers of a revolutionary movement would need to be the most class conscious folk within the proletariat um, class itself. Um, this is also a similar idea to Gramsci's idea of organic intellectuals, which is that everyone can workers, everyone can be an intellectual, according to him, but it, um, but there, there has to be this, this class consciousness that's in place um, for that person to then teach and educate the rest of the workers. Um, and so what folk music and punk rock have in common is that it was indeed composed of people in the working class themselves. And, oops, too far, okay. So, Lukash and Gramsci add one more qualification to this notion of full class consciousness. It's not enough that one becomes aware of class conflict. Thereafter, one must be unified in collective action. Theory must turn to praxis, agitation must turn to mobilization, because it is only when one understands the historical role and moral responsibility of their class that they can be said to be fully conscious. Punk is not only a music form, but also a community that attempts to sustain itself outside of and in opposition to mainstream culture. But this is oftentimes an uphill battle. Gramsci and Lukash uh, rejected the determinist interpretation of Marx, the belief that there's a historical inevitability of capitalism's demise due to economic forces and the material conditions of the proletariat being so dire that it invokes a revolution but rather class consciousness class yeah class consciousness is only a possibility and overcoming reification is this never ending laborious process that requires discipline from all workers as active subjects so punk in general also 
exemplifies a general culture of egalitarianism where these hierarchical lines of division can be blurred. The musicians are not meant to be celebritized and seen as more important than the audience. So for example, the crowd could jump onto the stage and the band could jump into the crowd. Mosh pits are a site of unified aggression, but if someone falls, they are immediately helped back up. People in the scene establish practices of mutual aid, such as allowing traveling bands to sleep in their homes or using the money earned from a show to contribute to a local cause. Um, and as this vanguard of full class consciousness, the scene also takes the means of production into their own hands. So owning their own work materials and the resulting profits of their labor through communal organization and decision-making. So as examples of that, so rather than relying on a record company or studio, a band will record their own music and distribute it in makeshift cardboard cases or digital links. Rather than conforming to like this influence of consumer culture, people will use thrift stores or customize their own clothes. Rather than relying on promoters, bands will organize their own shows in dingy local dive bars or abandoned oil stained warehouses or a local skate park or the basement of your friend's friend. Um, rather than relying on mainstream sources of media, people will create homemade zines, uh, patches and buttons sort of serve as this DIY publicity. Um, as well as pasting some of the band stickers on all those crumbling graffiti pissed walls of punk venue bathrooms. Um, and so these are all different ways that, that punk in general has been, um, has been conducting this experiment of, of a DIY ethos and um, a sort of proletarian culture from the ground up. And this, Cultural resistance to bourgeois ideology is, is, is like I said, that term proletarian culture is, comes from Antonio Gramsci, but this is not always easy to maintain. So then we come to like this, the difficult part or the sticky part. Um, it's difficult to escape the material confines of capitalism. And so this notion of selling out begins to gain more appeal to bands and musicians. And Lukash warns that class consciousness will lose its revolutionary potential when the unified community of the proletariat begins to disintegrate and loses its self-awareness and self-efficacy as this historically um, revolutionary class that it is. The problem, Lukash says, can be avoided with a political party, um, but punks, I guess, can keep their sort of quote unquote party going through a continual community building and clear and consistent message. But a more insidious threat pointed out by Gramsci um, is when he warns that the capitalist state often appropriates subversive culture. So he says that the capitalist state will try to maintain its legitimacy by allowing dissonant voices to express themselves ultimately turning them into what author Ben Davis calls meaningless symbolic theater. And we can see this capitalist appropriation occurring when bands, even those with subversive messages, get signed onto major record labels, when big multi-stage festivals like Warp Tour or Riot Fest are manacled to a slew of corporate sponsors, when new radio friendly bands emerge and imitate the sound and style, but not the message. And this continual internal conflict within punk bands, um, or that this is a, a continual internal conflict within punk bands, that they try to best their best to distance themselves from this process of self commodification, from this process of selling out, um, while also at the same time trying to like survive in the industry or trying to make a living. So to conclude, um, the roads, and I use the term pl plural roads, to revolution are long and hard, and each one of them is necessary, though not sufficient. But one of those necessary roads is the battle for ideology. The original punk ideology was birthed through the recognition of common working class struggles and all of its symptoms, so alienation, reification, precarious living and employment, addiction, consumerism, debt, et cetera. But punk grew into this global, at its height at least, punk grew into this 
this global antagonist of mainstream culture and music because of its existence within and vantage point from the disenfranchised class. And it has played a significant role in disrupting the corporate music industry as this hegemonic disseminator of bourgeois ideology. But now punk is at a formidable crossroads. Um, will it maintain its vanguard or will it simply become rock for sustainable capitalism? So, thank you. Thanks, Tiffany. That was really uh, enlightening and interesting. I'm excited for the conversation uh, when we get uh, through. Um, and just, you know, to let people know, I think we're going to have to, you know, maybe go just a little bit um, over. I hope that's okay today. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over to you, Patrick. Um, take it away. And um, yeah. Awesome, thank you. Um, yeah, uh, thanks for the uh, introduction, Brendan, and uh, thanks to Tiffany for inviting me to uh, come and talk about punk and philosophy today. Um, and because I'm going to talk about Diogenes, I also want to uh, give a shout out to uh, Professor Scott Austin that I studied uh, ancient philosophy with at Texas A&M, and uh, he passed away right at the end of the semester that I had him. And he was the one that kind of uh, encouraged me to um, start studying Diogenes. And, um, and so uh, I just wanted to sort of dedicate this to him as well, because I think he's one of the few uh, academics that really does sort of uh, embody what uh, I would say that Diogenes view is of divine friendship. So, um, but yes, uh, with that said, what I um, am going to talk about today is a lot about Diogenes and ancient cynicism and it's um, and what I think is its connection to modern punk music and um, punk culture. Um, and just sort of as a kind of uh, preface to this, if you're interested in this topic later, my views on this have been uh, very influenced, uh, heavily influenced by John Mole's uh, work on cynicism. And most of the references that I have from, oh, I think it's blurry, oh, it's not blurry, okay. Um, for Diogenes comes from the Robin Hard um, uh, edition with uh, Oxford University Press, the Oxford World Classics. So you should pick it up. It's going to be the best 13 bucks you ever spent. Um, so yeah, um, to begin, I think a lot of times when we think of Western philosophy, the history of Western philosophy is kind of like, well, there's Socrates or there's Plato and Aristotle in the, and the sort of debate between Aristotle becoming the, you know, setting the stage for all of Western philosophy. But I think that that oversimplifies the history and that cynicism is a third pillar of this history of Western philosophy that we ought to uh, pay attention to. And by connecting it to punk today, I kind of hope to sort of uh, make that a kind of salient claim for everybody um, uh, that is in attendance or that may watch this in a video later or, or anything like that. And um, the main thing that I think is distinctive about cynicism is that it it's not so much concerned with uh, ontology or epistemology, but it's concerned with uh, axiology, values axiology as first philosophy. And in this framing, what you end up getting then is not a fundamental distinction between truth and falsehood, um, but a fundamental distinction between nature and culture, which does represent truth and falsehood, um, that sort of uh, distinction. But it does so, um, you know, but truth and falsehood is a sort of a product of the nature culture distinction rather than the other way around. Uh, for the cynic tradition. So I'm going to talk a lot about Diogenes of Sinope today. And uh, this dude was cool. I don't know if you've ever heard of him, but uh, he walked around in the middle of the daytime with a lantern right in the marketplace and somebody asked him what he was doing. He said, I'm looking for an honest person. Um, when uh, he was out, I mean, he didn't have a house. He lived in a in a jar <laughs> and, you know, masturbating in public. And when people criticize it for him, he said, yeah, and how great would it be if I could just rub my stomach and make hunger go away, right? So, um, so you know, he uh, brings a lot of, I think, distinctive original philosophical contributions uh, in the use of irony. I mean, he takes Socrates' use of irony and sort of puts it on steroids, turns it up to 11. Um, he uh, is far more, iconoclastic than even Socrates is. And this is why a lot of people call them, you know, Socrates gone mad. And, um, and then also this notion of 
defacing the currency in modern times, you know, for situationist international people, you might um, uh, know of this as detournement or, you know, uh, culture jamming or something like this. These are all kinds of things that kind of originate in ancient cynicism. And so Diogenes actually had to leave his home. He was accused of defacing the currency. And this is like a, a very important biographical, but also philosophical point of, uh, of Diogenes's life, but also, you know, his, his views. Um, so Susan Prince, she says, the Greek word for currency takes its root from the word for custom, and in particular form refers to either the coined money or to the ways of culture. Now, one of the things that Diogenes had to do, or one of the things, reasons that he had to leave his homeland is because he was accused of defacing the currency, putting scratches on the official money. And, uh, and so he, you know, there's some kinds of um, controversies about this. Some people say, well, his father did it, or some people say he was falsely accused of doing it, but it still wraps up his disposition nicely. If we think about currency as in money, but also as in language, he would manipulate language in such a way to make the familiar uh, unrecognizable or to make the familiar unfamiliar um, through the use of irony. And so Susan Prince continues, the word for deface is derived from the word for stamping, which could be used uh, literally in reference to misstamping the coinage or metaphorically in reference to restamping public custom in a new direction. And this is important for understanding what Diogenes is up to, because in this nature culture distinction, for Diogenes, culture is inauthentic. It is false. It is the thing that leads us away from virtue. And for Diogenes, virtue is, is, the, is the central set of values. Um, and we don't have to get into some kind of you know, exhaustive list of what the virtues are, but just virtue itself. And nature is going to be where you can go back to, to cultivate virtue, to remind yourself what virtue is supposed to be about. And this is why Diogenes shuns everything that has to do with the social structure, with culture, with society. This is why he has this kind of anti-materialist view. Um, wealth and virtue for Diogenes are mutually exclusive. If you're rich, you can't be virtuous, right, uh, for, for, for Diogenes. Um, this is why he had few possessions. He had his robe and he had a, a, a jar to sleep in, right? His tub that he lived in. Um, he actually did have a third possession at one point. It was a cup and he saw a little kid drinking with his hands. And so he smashed his cup because he decided that nature had given him perfectly, two perfectly good cups already, right? He didn't need that third possession. And, um, and some of these kinds of things really sort of uh, capture what, what Diogenes is, is up to in, in his philosophical views. And so this quote from Susan Prince, where she says, you know, stamping the coinage or, or, or messing, restamping public custom in a new direction. What he's trying to do is take those things out of circulation, modify them, put them back into circulation so that you can get some kind of critical distance, critical perspective on culture as such, because that's what opens up the way for you to go, hey, I see some of the problems with this now. And he can go, yeah, let's go back to nature. Come on, you, know, you can come with me too. We can both learn virtue together. Um, Diogenes thought that social customs actually impeded authentic relationships. I would say that Diogenes' notion of authentic relationships should be called divine friendship. I don't need to give that argument now, but there is a kind of authentic relationship for Diogenes and an inauthentic relationship. So just to illustrate the inauthentic, relationship for Diogenes. Uh, one time a young man came to him. He said, I want to study philosophy with you. So Diogenes, they were in the market. Diogenes picked up a fish and handed him the fish and said, here, carry this for me. And the young man dropped the fish and ran away. And he ran and he did this because in the marketplace, only slaves carried fishes, fishes, fish, fish. Only slaves carried the fishes, right? And so he didn't want to be seen as a slave. But Diogenes, this was a test for him. Because Diogenes was wondering, how seriously do you actually take social custom? Will you carry a fish and not care that other people think that this is only what slaves do? Um, of course, Diogenes ran into him later, as the story goes, and he says, hey, look, here's the guy who ended our relationship over a fish. So just to show how absolutely trivial this whole thing was, right? Um, 
Now, Diogenes, there's some also debate about how cosmopolitan Diogenes is. And if he is cosmopolitan, what does this mean? I tend to take the interpretation that for Diogenes, cosmopolitanism is a sort of twofold thing. And again, I get this from John Moles. Um, first, it's a negation. It's against culture. But it's also positive. It's for nature. And so if you're a citizen of the world, if you're a cosmopolitan, then you live according to nature, not according to this or that particular local custom, which people think is so important, and yet it's just some shit we all made up. But what is real? How do you actually get back to authentic relationships? And, um, and so for uh, my interpretation of, of Diogenes, he's saying, no, there's something outside of culture that we can uh, engage with that actually shows us the way to authentic relationships. That if I'm a citizen of the cosmos and you're a citizen of the cosmos, and we've both done our best to uh, distance ourselves from culture and get back to nature or virtue, then we can have some kind of authentic relationship. And, um, and with that comes all sorts of ethical obligations to other people and stuff. So there's some, you know, there's, there's some more um, uh, nuances there in, in Diogenes than uh, we might, than we might think. Um, and so all of this is why Diogenes did not take, you know, uh, intellectuals, politicians seriously. He endlessly mocked Plato and Aristotle. Um, he crunched seeds when philosophers were giving speeches and when everyone turned around to look at him, he said, my, my eating is more interesting than their talk, you know? So um, when Alexander came to visit him, Alexander said, if I wasn't Alexander the Great, I would want to be Diogenes. And Diogenes said, yeah, if I wasn't Diogenes, I'd want to be Diogenes too. So he just had no, you know, uh, this sort of iconoclasm. Now we fast forward to the 18th century, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, the father of romanticism and the new Diogenes. This is not by mistake. It's because modern romanticism is a modified version of ancient cynicism. There's this idea that, that there's something outside of society a lot of romantics thought it actually was nature, um, but also there's this new idea of interiority that gets um, introduced in modern romanticism, uh, to borrow the word from, from Kierkegaard the way that he says it. And, um, and the idea is that your interiority is what is authentically, uniquely yourself. And this is why in On the Social Contract, Rousseau says, everywhere man is born in chains, I think I can justify them. But in doing so, what he's trying to do is say, how can we set up a political society? Because we can't just go back to nature. We can't go backwards in time. If we look at his essay on the origin of inequality, if we look at his critique of um, uh, the arts and sciences, and he says, look, like by introducing property, by introducing all these social customs, we've actually made ourselves really like petty, shitty kinds of beings, and humans used to be something else. Um, you know, he says, we can't get back to where we were. There is no going back. But how can we set up society such that it actually fosters enough of this authenticity? It creates a space for this authenticity, um, this interiority to flourish without being, you know, um, uh, squeezed out um, by, by social custom. And that laying the foundation for romanticism, I would say it's pretty clear that punk inherits this romantic view. Um, Punk culture is uh, heavily critical of society, of social custom, of, of um, our political and economic institutions. Um, it does prioritize something like uh, disalienation. It does prioritize things like authenticity, auth the authentic self, things like this. And so there are many ways in which punk is similar to ancient cynicism or modern romanticism as sort of a, a version of cynicism. And I'll just give a, a couple of examples, uh, largely from the dead Kennedys. So when you think about dead Kennedys, you think about um, some of their album titles or their song titles, like, um, you know, uh, for example, uh, Bedtime for Democracy, probably one of the best punk albums of all time. Now, this is a play on a Ronald Reagan film called Bedtime for Bonzo, right, where he's trying to put a monkey to bed. And, um, and, uh, he does more stuff with the monkey. I'm not, well, I don't mean that to sound dirty, but you know, it's Reagan. So, um, so bedtime for democracy is this idea that they're going to take a Reagan film from the fifties and change it just slightly and put it back into circulation 
such that you have to go, oh, this is a play off of Reagan. Reagan is president. It's 1986 when the album comes out. And you can kind of see this sort of thing in propaganda, no effects. A lot of punk bands use this sort of thing. Um, another thing that the Dead Kennedys uh, did was to mock political authorities. So back in the 80s, when Dianne Feinstein was running for mayor of San Francisco, she boldly came out and proclaimed she's going to clean up this city. Well, one of the people she was running against was Jello Biafra, the singer from Dead Kennedys. And so he was going to clean up the city too, and he was going to start with Dianne Feinstein. So he went to her house and stood in her front yard with a vacuum cleaner to cl start cleaning up the city right at the source of the corruption, right? And, um, and this is kind of like Diogenes, you know, one time Diogenes saw uh, a little kid getting arrested for stealing bread and Diogenes said, hey, look, the big thieves have come to take away the little thief. Um, and so there's this idea that, you know, whatever kind of individual corruption we might see on the part of the dispossessed, the poor, the outcast, that corruption, that criminality is already baked into, it's already structured into um, the society at large. And, uh, and so it's some of these kinds of culture jamming things, um, defacing the currency, it's some of these kinds of uses of irony or, um, or uh, iconoclasm that really, um, I think, captures a lot of what is going on in punk. Now, does this mean that all punk bands or all people who are associated with the, um, uh, the punk uh, seen or participated in in any kind of way, all sort of go along going, yes, yes, you know, I, I'm a cynic in the ancient sense, and so of course not, right? But there is this sort of um, strand of thought, a strand of culture within Western societies that I think actually is part of the foundation or the core of what the punk movement actually is. In terms of distance itself from society, um, it's looking for that alternative. And there might be different kinds of alternative. Maybe some people, maybe some punks really think, yeah, it's nature or that there's some true self that you have to get back to or something like that. But the core idea, the core or, um, orientation here is that there's something fundamentally alienating and um, inauthentic about culture, about our social institutions, and that we have to distance ourselves from them to get back to something that's more authentic, something that's um, something that's more real, and I and I think you know there's um, some space. I don't have a really well worked out theory on this, but I'm just going to drop this hypothesis, and maybe somebody smarter than me can run with it at some point. But I think there's some real core of of um, virtue ethics uh, built in here as well, just as for Diogenes, virtue is sort of the core value that we need to get back to. I do think that. Um, uh, at least some of the, the better aspects of the punk scene that I've been involved with or that I have identified with um, in, my, in my sort of personal experience with all of it, um, you know, has really been about how is it that you become virtuous? And it can't be by identifying with a decadent, exploitative, violent, uh, inhumane culture like we have um, uh, in the United States or just uh, in the Anglophone um, world you know, in the 20th and 21st century. So, um, so yeah, with that, I'll, um, I'll uh, break and then, you know, hopefully we can have some good questions, good discussions. So thank you. Uh, that's great. Thank you so much, Patrick. These are really um, interesting ideas. And so one of the things that I sort of wanted to start with and just get you get your vibes on um, is do you think of punk? So you've used a lot of different words. You've talked about subculture, um, Obviously, there's a genre that we can call punk. And then, you know, but through the connection to cynicism, we can think ethos or lifestyle or, you know, even way of like total way of being in the world. Um, so, you know, how are you, I guess, thinking about this? Is it, is it an aesthetic? Is it a culture uh, or a subculture, a way of being in the world, all of the above, just a form of music? You know, how, how do you want to sort of parse the the sort of conceptual space of what is punk. And I'll put that to both of you. So whoever wants to go first. Do you want to take it first, Tiffany, or? I'll just say really quick. And then if, if I have more ideas, I'll jump in again. But um, I, my first inclination is to say all of the above that, yes, I think it's going to be a culture. It's also going to be an ethos. It's going to be a lifestyle. Um, 
I know, lifestyle is kind of a strange word. Maybe I'd say ethos. They'll just, we'll keep lifestyle on the side, but a culture and ethos. Um, and, and also an aesthetic movement, like an artistic, an artistic movement, right? So like um, the, the texts that come out of it being like the lyrics or the, the songs themselves, right? So yeah, all of the above is what my initial inclina inclination would be. Yeah, I would, um, I would be, uh, I, I would be inclined to take a similar position. So if we think about like, you know, so for me, cynicism is about axiology as being first philosophy, right? So values come first, or at least values are the way that you get to other types of things like knowledge and so on. Um, and that means that virtue is the priority. Well, if we think about like the relationship between aesthetic value and moral values in this kind of way, there's some people who take the position that like, well, there are moral values and there are aesthetic values and you can judge works of art without appealing to any kind of morals at all. And then there are, um, and then there are others. And, by, and even if by appealing to morals or ethical values, you actually uh, impede a proper understanding of the artwork itself. Whereas another view of the art and morality relationship is that, well, these are fundamentally intertwined sets of values and you really can't have good art without also it being um, morally justifiable or morally desirable or morally good in, in the same way. And I would say that at least for me, my approach to punk is somewhat the latter. And I think that that is uh, consistent with the cynic view. I don't think that uh, the cynics would say, well, you can just have art for art's sake. They're going to say, why the hell would you have this like, you know, uh, terrible art that in that inculcates all these like, you know, um, vices into the into the viewers or, or whatever, that art should be some kind of morally uplifting, or at least help you uh, get back to virtue in some kind of way. And I think that the best punk music is the kind of music that helps people get back to virtue in some kind of way, if they're really able to tune in, pay attention closely. Um, and I would say that some, of, at least for me, some of the paradigm bands for this would be something like Dead Kennedys or Propagandi, um, where the the sound itself isn't just this kind of like hot topic, you know, Green Day, uh, Blink-182 kind of stuff. It's... Um, it's a kind of aesthetic that actually challenges you at your core and that by doing so does help you get back to virtue in some very important way. So that's all very interesting. And, and I, I really love where you've gone. I have some questions wrestling in my head as well here, but I really wanna turn it over to the people who sort of chimed in on uh, Facebook. So I'm gonna do that first. Um, the first thing um, I see here that I'm gonna ask comes to us and it says, uh, I would be interested in hearing some uh, hearing some wrestling with the actual sound of punk and how it can affect consciousness. For example, the stripped down nature of punk is part of the argument for its authenticity, um, but it also strips down, he, th he thinks, to a purely Western tradition of chord progressions that in some ways could trace back to Baroque or other pre, you know, Western um, greats. Um, so somebody like Mark Blitzstein, he says, wrote pro-union music, but also made music that was difficult to listen to uh, in order to get people out of complacent or easy listening. Um, so punk's loudness and noise could be part of that not easy listening aspect. Um, but, you know, it, it, could we talk a little bit about how punk actually sounds? I guess that's the biggest way of sort of posing that question. So Tiffany, you want to start us off with that and then we can come back to Patrick? Yeah, actually, um, that was the part that I left out of my presentation. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, for the sake of time and everything. Um, yeah, I do think that the way that it sounds sonically is going to be is going to play a big role in the sort of revolutionary fervor that it's sort of invoking. It's sort of like invoking this affect within um, the audience or the listener, whether that's because it's you know fast. Um, and well, so first we can take different aspects of it. So there's the, um, there's just like the stripped down um, fact that you don't have to necessarily be a good musician to play punk. Um, and that part can play some role in making a comment about the egalitarianism uh, 
philosophy sort of embedded within punk, um, this idea of um, of the the lowest of the lowest of the people can still participate and participate in the aesthetic production of music. Um, but then there's also, um, if you look at certain subgenres of punk, like Oi, for instance, um, you have you'll see similarities with um, with worker songs. So whether you're talking about um, like also whether it's like labor songs like chain gang songs or whether it's labor songs like um like galley I forgot like galley songs galley um chants um that the galley slaves or workers that would work on galleys would use um to sort of create this uh rhythm for their work so uh, the rhythm would help the workers to sort of keep moving along it would also sort of boost morale um but then punk uses the, some of those similar elements, um, especially with oi or with um, some other street punk um, type of subgenres, where the rhythm is a lot more mechanical and sort of like simplistic, um, and it's very chanty, right? Um, and so you see this also in like protest chants, right? So this like. It, within the the labor songs from from like the early 30s um or any of or any protests that you hear today like you go out to a protest um punk tends to adopt some of those things as well where you have um you have gang vocals for example inserted into into songs um where you have gang vocals essentially like you have a whole crowd of people chanting something over and over again um what else um there's a lot there's a lot there and i think that those are some of the first things that are coming to mind um but yeah i do think that that the the sound of the music itself, even if you just took you know the lyrics away and just like said gibberish, it's still gonna invoke some. It's gonna invoke a um, an affect from the listener of like energizing them. So because of the speed of it, right? But then also like these notions that or these portions of the sound that create unity within the crowd like everyone singing all together for like a particular gang vocal part or something that's also going to create like um well unity right it's also going to create a, um a unified um a unified crowd um who's sort of like energized and like ready to start a revolution or something so yeah Yeah, and I think yeah, that's I you know I always think of gang vocals too, right? Like uh, participation, um, you know, breaking down the hierarchy of like that's the person on stage and so on. That's like another way of of sonically or formally doing that. Um, I, I'm not an ethnomusicologist or a music historian, but um, I do think that we can think of punk as part of this sort of Western tradition of of aesthetics. But also, you know, I mean, it's a post blues form of art because it's part of it's part of rock rock is post blues so you don't get this without you know uh very particular manifestations of of expression in african-american culture so it is piggybacking off of that whether or not we should see this as a kind of appropriation or uh theft or anything like that i think you know we can have interesting conversations about but um you know there's a reason that the kind of like um uh, what do they call those kids in the fifties that like were listening to black music? You know, were they were they hipsters? Were they what were? They, well, I don't remember the term for for them, but you know, I mean, if you think about it, right? What are they doing? Right? Uh, they're they're going, hey, look, these oppressed people are actually expressing something pretty beautiful, and that appeals to me. And there's a way that moving to that uh, to that sound is actually, um, uh, I think, indicative of sort of an opening up that uh, some of these white kids are alienated from this society that's supposed to be built for them. I think you see this in, in punk culture as well. And, um, and I say this not as an external observer, but as somebody who would go, that's probably how I got into punk, you know? And that's probably how I got into hip hop. And that's probably why 
I wrote my dissertation in Africana philosophy. Um, you know, it's these kinds of things where you sort of look at, you know, this culture that's supposed to be yours and you go, what? Fuck that. I want to go look for something authentic. And then that's when you start, you know, doing this move. And I mean, you know, people criticize Rousseau. He never used the term noble savage, right? But Rousseau, you know, he might've been Eurocentric, but he wasn't um, necessarily uh, um, a Euro chauvinist, right? He was like, you know, we have a really decadent culture and maybe there's some people out there who just have it a little bit, who, who, uh, who have some better ideas about how to live than we do, some more virtuous ideas about how to live than we do. And, uh, and so I think just that little grain of, of critical distance from, from the dominant culture, from hegemony, whatever we want to call it, um, you know, does open up pathways to thinking about different ways to be a human being. And at, at the core of it, at least for me, it's that what is the human being and what is, what is it in fact right now? And what is it supposed to be? And if there's a divergence between the two, how can we make that happen? Um, to me, that's really sort of what, uh, what a lot of this is all about. I don't know if that answers the question, but that's my, that's my best attempt. So that's all very interesting. And so I just want to make sure it's okay with you. I'd like to go 10 extra, 10 more minutes, if that's okay, to 515, if you all can do it. Because uh, we have a lot of good questions on Facebook. So I, I'd like to be able to get some of those out to you. Um, the first one, and it's really one that I thought of a lot, Tiffany, while you were presenting, it's directed directly towards you. But actually, I think um, Crass as a band actually even speaks to some of what you've been talking about, Patrick. So maybe maybe you both would like to kind of weigh in on this. Um, and, and then also, I think um, Crass as a band might even provide a, a path in to, to talking about some of the bigger issues about the inheritance from romanticism. Um, but so wh why am I mentioning Crass? Because the, the person talks about anarchism. And in fact, I think, you know, the truth of the matter, I'm, I'm, not to, I'm definitely not trying to downplay the, the role of Marxism <laughs> within punk rock, but certainly it's clear, you know, in, in the imagery that anarchism as an explicit ideology is widespread, uh, deeply embedded within the punk scene. And then it's also been the case, you know, you, you mentioned uh, Screeching Weasel. I mean, we can look at, uh, you know, bands throughout the 80s. I mean, Black Flag's name <laughs> should tell us what they're about. Um, so there, there's, there's, a, there's a historical understanding, and it's, an, it's one that's actually built that where the musicians aren't just playing music. They actually are part of, uh, act, you know, activist scenes as well, a part of anarchist organizing. Um, and squats the whole nine. So I guess if you could maybe talk about connecting the picture that you've already provided, Tiffany, to this question of anarchism and its its role in punk, and then kind of in a related vein, if you, if you see Patrick any relationship between anarchism as a stance and cynicism, and this sort of you know as you've developed it to romanticism and Rousseau. So uh, Tiffany, if you want to take that, yeah, um, yeah, I think. Yeah, it's undeniable that anarchy play or that anarchism, anarchistic um, philosophies are deeply embedded within punk, um, and and it's not problematic to um, this to a Marxist analysis of this either. I don't. I mean, I think we're all homies. <laughs> the anarchists, the socialists, the communists, like they're all they're all homies and stuff. Um, the uh, of course, there's you know there's disagreements about um, about uh, end results, or there's disagreements about uh, how we're going to get to different places and things like that. But um, but it's all part of the same scene, and I think that kind of plays into just the general um, culture of punk is that uh, it's going to have this range. It's it's going to have this range of not only class consciousness. So the reason why I focused on a uh, sort of more of a Marxist analysis was because I'm making this distinction of these different, like this, this class uh, consciousness um, in these different stages as it's going along. Um, and then bringing in some of these ideas from Lukash and Gramsci who were um, Marxists themselves and everything. But, um, but yeah, no, it's undeniable that, that anarchy is gonna play a role into all of that as well. Um, the only difference it makes is the, uh, yeah, maybe the the philosophical ideas of of um, strategy or something like that. But um, yeah, that you have mutual aid. Mutual aid is a, a huge part of um, of punk and sort of like this kind of 
kind of ties or overlaps with uh, the sort of DIY ethos. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure if I answered the question, but I guess I'm just sort of answering it in the affirmative, like, yeah, anarchy is there too. Yeah, I definitely think that um, cynicism and anarchism, modern anarchism, have some kind of uh, important relationship. I think we could think of, of Diogenes as, as some kind of anarchist and not strain the word at all. Um, to what extent do modern anarchists of various strands identify Diogenes as part of their intellectual tradition or or anything like that. I have no idea. I wouldn't want to, uh, you know, put words in people's mouth or speak on behalf of them in that kind of way. But um, but uh, at least I don't think that um, it's out of the realm of plausibility to think of cynicism as uh, a version of anarchism, um, and uh, at least in the way that Diogenes talks about it. And Rousseau is not an anarchist, but I do think that anarchism is uh, deeply indebted, especially 19th and early 20th century anarchism, deeply indebted to the romantic tradition. Um, that's just unquestionable. So in the sense that there's an important connection between Rousseau and Diogenes there, um, you know, that all sort of reinforces that view as well. But, um, but just without the sort of uh, historical evidence of saying like, this person was like, Diogenes is the shit, I wouldn't want to say like, uh, I wouldn't want to say, you know, too confidently that, um, you know, Bakunin or Benjamin Tucker or anybody are sitting there going, you know, I'm a cynic or something like that. So. All right. So I think we have time for maybe one more question. So I'll try to get it out here and um, maybe for this final one. So I think we've gone Tiffany, Patrick each time. Maybe we'll go Patrick, Tiffany, just to shave, just to change things up at the end. Um, so. The final question that I was going to pose that, that came to us on Facebook is about racial and gender oppression and the extent to which those appear within or are simply excluded from uh, punk. And, you know, I mean, I mean, one place to look, I think, to talk about this, and maybe it's something you could both engage in, is, you know, by the by the 90s, of course, you, you have, um, say, like the riot girl movement. That, that's very expressly and deliberately calling out what they see as misogyny uh, within the scene. Um, and, you know, actively working to rethink how punk, what punk is going to look like, even at the level of the shows. I mean, Tiffany, you mentioned mosh pits before, you know, that can be a pretty testosterone heavy, bro heavy uh, area, right? Even if there is a communal spirit uh, within that space. So, um, Putting all that together, you know, do we do we want to be critical of punk with respect to this question of racial or gender oppression, and and you know what is the space for questioning? I guess um, you know punk itself with respect to its lack of maybe intersectional consciousness. Yeah. So um, yeah, this is a great question. Um, it's something that uh, Tiffany and I have actually had conversations about too, um, and you know things that I've been kind of interested in, especially. As someone who grew up as, uh, you know, um, being identified as a white dude in the punk scene, and then later on going on to study Africana philosophy, anti-colonialism, and going, all right, like, you know, to what extent do my own values and, and personal experience, what, you know, are they bound up with racism, colonialism, how, you know, so you got to kind of work through that kind of thing. Um, coming for a circle, perhaps, back to this uh, uh, philosophy and punk rock um, book that Tiffany and I both wrote essays for in the pop culture and philosophy series. Um, my article, my essay in that one was actually about Riot Girl, um, and uh, the argument is that Riot Girl can be considered a kind of feminist aesthetic critique in the sense that it, it is doing what feminist aesthetics does in reading the history of Western art and saying, look at the male um, values that that form and shape these kinds of artworks but also that and more importantly that riot girl should be considered a um type of feminist aesthetic practice or feminist aesthetic creation in the sense that riot girl music isn't just punk music with feminist lyrics but that the actual um formal aesthetic 
uh, properties of the performance as a whole, including the body as a part of the work of art and things like this, that that it itself is all uh, part of feminist aesthetic creation. So that's why it should be considered not just uh, art with a feminist message, but feminist art proper. So that was the argument. And I use, you know, examples from Bikini Kill um, and things like that, just to illustrate those are, essays are shorter, but I mean, you can find other examples from you know, uh, L7 and, and um, Babes in Toyland and all those kinds of uh, bands as well. Um, so I do think that, you know, Riot Girl does try to bring some of that in um, into the, the scene as well. You do have some, um, you know, predominantly male or all male punk bands that uh, critique these kinds of things. You can think of like Dead Kennedys, uh, Macho Insecurity, Good Riddance, um, uh, he's a credit to his gender, or, you know, a lot of early propaganda, especially, you know, trying to get get to these kinds of things as well, um, critiquing the homophobia and stuff in the hardcore scene and, and these kinds of things. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I definitely think that um, Riot Girl music, um, even in contemporary Riot Girl bands like War on Women, if you haven't listened to them, go listen to them. They're friggin' awesome. Um, even bands like that, um, White Lung, they're they're carrying on that kind of Riot Girl legacy, not just writing from a woman's perspective, not just writing about women, but also creating art that is supposed to capture something uh, sonically, not just lyrically um, about, about those kinds of issues. So um, in the interest of not taking up too much time, I'll sort of touch on that part. Um, but then, uh, you know, I guess... I'll leave the colonialism, racism stuff out and uh, for now. Yeah, um, I guess I could jump up and pick up where he left off um, about the racism stuff. So um, yeah, I think it's also undeniable that, uh, that punk is you know, predominantly white and male. Um, but I do think that there's, um, there's been these instances, I mean, there's the, uh, the rock against racism back in like the UK. Um, in its early days in the 70s. So I think the story goes that, um, that the, and someone who knows more about this than me can correct me, but that the song White Riot by The Clash um, was supposed to be about saying like, look, black people are standing up. We need to do the same um, as in like in solidarity, like with them, like, so the, the Clash had the, the, but with the song like White Riot, you know, maybe it, has mixed messages for other people, but but either way, they're around that time period. Um, Martin Webster's like National Front started forming, and they like this white nationalist group in the UK, um, and they started coming to scenes and recruiting people, um, and and we see this today with um, uh, with any other like white nationalist punk scenes or just. Uh, white nationalist groups in general, sometimes they'll sort of infiltrate scenes and try to recruit people. Um, but yeah, so this was happening, um, you know, around the time in the UK when the, er, when the clash was, you know, first, first uh, playing around. Um, they, and so because of this, the clash in response to that, along with other bands at the time period, along with other bands in the, in the area, um, made um, Rock Against Racism, to try to counter that movement of the National Front um, trying to infiltrate the punk scene. Um, but I think this battle has been sort of going on for a long time now. Um, I do think it's gotten better, um, but, but yeah, this battle not only uh, with the predominance of like the white dominance of um, within punk is, has been there for a while, um, with at the same time with these like movements to try to counter it, or you have like sharps, like sharp skins, right? So like the skinheads against racial prejudice um, that that try to counter it. But but yeah, I think these are these are real things. Great. Well, unfortunately, we're gonna have to uh, call it. It's almost twenty minutes over time, so I think there's just no choice. Um, but I really, really, I, I enjoyed this. And I don't think I'm alone in saying that I enjoyed this because Facebook is full of comments that I didn't get to. Uh, to anybody who commented that I was unable to get to your question, I'm very sorry. We were just over time and it seems like everybody had uh, you know, a lot of interest in what was being said. So thank you so much, Patrick and Tiffany. This was fantastic.
Yeah, thank you. And um, at least on my part, if anybody had uh, like any questions or conversations or, you know, uh, criticisms, you know, you can send those to someone else, but, uh, you know, questions, conversations, if you wanted to uh, talk about this more, just feel free to send me an email, you know, uh, I never really get to talk about this stuff. So and, and it's super cool to me. So if you have some uh, stimulating conversation that you can offer. Um, yeah, just shoot me an email. Um, it's p anderson at centralstate.edu. You can also just uh, look up um, my uh, Phil People uh, profile or on ResearchGate. Uh, I don't have Facebook or anything like that, Twitter. So you're just gonna have to do some old old fashioned emailing. But if you uh, if you do that, then um, then yeah, we can we can talk. So and thanks for thanks for. Same, yes, same thing. If you have pressing questions that you really, really want to talk about, then feel free to reach out to me. Um, yeah, just just search for me. Um, <laughs> and yeah, these are all these are all ongoing. It'll be helpful too because these are ongoing questions uh, that actually that Patrick and I are going to be sort of like working on some joint projects potentially together. So uh, in the same the same topic. So if you all have ideas or crit criticisms or comments or whatever that'll help us out to think through think through some of these things thank you yeah awesome. and if anybody has their own ideas and they want to write an essay for an anthology um we've had this idea too we just don't know anybody who wants to do it so if you're that person let us know because then we can maybe have a kick-ass book out there sometime all right sounds great well thank you thank you both this was very very good and uh hopefully we'll get the chance to um yeah, to, to, to hear more from you sometime, sometime soon.